Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 277. My name is Arobin Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a quick word of prayer. Avinu Malkin, our Father, our King. Lord, we uh, thank you for approaching... Well, by the time this recording goes out, we will have already participated in the festival known on the calendar as Rosh Hashanah, but the Bible, the Bible calls the festival Yom Tov, the Day of the Awakening Trumpet Blast. And the themes surrounding this particular festival are quite simple. Sound an alarm so that you can wake up. It's, it's kind of like what we do in our regular everyday um activity of setting an alarm to wake up from sleep, except this type of wake up, we realize, Lord, is much, much more serious. The theme surrounding this festival is Awake, O Spiritual Sleeper. And so, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to awaken us and to cause us to realize the urgency of the matter. Indeed, the theme of the festival is related to the fact that the King is going to be coming He's approaching, and awake, O oh sleeper, get yourself ready, prepare yourself to meet your Lord. And so that's the attitude that we want to have as we consider this particular uh, festival. Thank you for the special times that you've placed on your calendar, that you invited Israel to join with you, to participate with, and to declare these truths to the rest of the world. Help us again to um, be aware of the times in which we're living. Uh, be with us tonight. We'll be careful to give you the praise and glory. But shame Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for these live internet studies one more time. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. The live internet studies are an hour and a half long. In case you're only watching this video, this um, first, say, 20 minute video on the topic of rapture and things like that, the entire study is an hour and a half long, but it's broken up into two segments. The first segment is the hour-long study, eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events. We talk about things like rapture, book of Revelation, um, things like that. We're, we're working our way towards the book of Revelation. We're actually in topic 11 out of, I think, like 18 topics or something like that. I'll show you, I'll flash the topical index on the screen later on, but um, or in post-production, but I'm not going to show it to you right now. The second topic is entitled, A Trinitarian Response to Biblical Unitarianism. It's kind of in a continuation of my uh, exegeting, um, I'm sorry, um, exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity, where it's an apologetic section dealing with issues related to a kind of a mock a debate between a Trinitarian and a Biblical Unitarian. So, if you're interested in both topics, stick around for the entire show, okay? Let's jump right into the first topic. Um, eschatology, a Biblical study of end-time events. Eschatology, the word itself, suggests the end times, the eschaton, those events which take place later on. What you can see on your screen right now is a slide that captures four of the main rapture views that are predominant in messy or in uh, Christian circles, reading from um, top to bottom and from left to right, upper left corner, pre-tribulation rapture. These views are in response to the question asked at the top of this slide. It says, when will God rapture the church? What are the four different views? First view, pre-tribulation rapture. The name says it all. This, by the way, assumes a seven-year time period at the very end of God dealing with mankind, dealing with uh, evil, bringing in his kingdom. Uh, when I say dealing with evil, we're talking about dealing with the Antichrist and the false prophet who are going to be on the scene someday. Um, the pre-trib rapture answers this question, when will God rapture the church? This way, according to this slide, pre-tribulation rapturists believe the church will be raptured before this final seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week. Now, this slide calls this time frame Daniel's 70th week, but I think that's probably one of the better ways to describe it. This slide was put together by um, uh, Zion's Hope, which is a pre-wrath outfit like myself. So they don't call this time period the 70th, I'm sorry, they don't call it the uh, seven-year tribulation. If this were your standard pre-trib um, 
belief system, if this whole slide was put together by the pre-tribbers themselves, they wouldn't call it the Daniel 70th week. They would probably call it the seven-year tribulation, as do many of the other group, uh, label, uh, the other um, rapture views. Everyone except pre-wrath rapture, I believe. Even the post-tribbers call it the seven-year tribulation for the most part. So, pre-trib rapture rapture is at the very beginning of the seven years. Upper right corner, mid-trib rapture. Mid-tribulation rapturists believe the rapture will occur halfway through the seven-year period, just before the beginning of the great tribulation. And you can tell by looking at the two slides comparatively, left and right, the top, the two top ones, they're basically the same theology, just the mid-trib is shrunk down in terms of the size of God's wrath, but everything else is more or less the same. The, meaning, the impact of the rapture removes God's people from planet Earth before any significant tribulation. Um, lower left corner, post-tribulation rapture. Post-tribulation rapturists believe that rapture will occur following the seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week. Again, they would probably call it the seven-year tribulation, no, uh, owing to the fact that if you look at the slide, God's wrath slash tribulation is running the entire seven years. And it's in their name. This is why I'm saying this. In the name, it says post-trib. They mean after the seven-year tribulation. There's some equivocation of the word tribulation from my perspective, only because I don't view the entire seven years as tribulation. But if in your normal, everyday, garden variety conversation that you have with uh, your average Christian, if you ask him when, how long is the tribulation period, they're probably going to tell you it's seven years long. So the name post-trib means post-seven-year tribulation, just like pre-tribulation rapture means pre-seven-year tribulation rapture, and mid-tribulation means middle of the seven-year tribulation. So you can hear it in their name. Thus, when we get to this final lower right corner, the one known as pre-wrath rapture, one of the first things that the pre-wrath rapturists do is they remove the equivocated word tribulation out of the equation. And there's no such pre or mid or post um, tribulation label in their name at all. It's named pre-wrath. So what happens to the seven-year tribulation? It's no longer called the seven-year tribulation by design. It's simply called the seven-year time period or Daniel's 70th week, which is closer to the biblical designation that we feel is accurate to this time frame. That's not to say that we don't think that the seven years will be a tribulational time period, meaning it won't be full of troublesome events. We do believe it will include troublesome events. But the reason we're not giving it the label seven-year tribulation has more to do with dispensationalism than it does with uh, denying that there will be tribulation. So what's the position in pre-wrath? The uh, little description reads, pre-wrath rapturists believe the rapture will occur following the opening of the sixth seal of the book of Revelation, which the sixth seal itself happens sometime after the midpoint, but before the very end of the seven-year time frame. So it's important to locate the sequencing of the sixth seal as um, occurring in sometime between the midpoint and the very end. The church, it goes on to say, will experience severe persecution by the Antichrist, right, what we call the Great Tribulation, but will be snatched away before God begins to pour out His wrath during the Day of the Lord. So, if you just look at all four of the views, you'll notice that uh, the, the first three have this first half of the 70th week labeled as tribulation. But when you get to the pre-wrath rapture in the lower right corner, they don't use that label. We don't use that label tribulation. Again, it's by design. It's to avoid the equivocation on a term that's not biblical, and yet... At the same time, it's a popular term, so I'm not going to be too harsh on people using that term. Not every term is biblical. The word Great Tribulation is biblical. The word Tribulation itself is biblical, but there's some debate on when the timing is. However, even the... We're going to find out tonight. I'm going to talk about, just briefly, even the phrase Second Coming, which is on all four charts, right? At the far right of every chart, 
There's a little arrow, black arrow, pointing down that says second coming. For the most part, it says second coming. Except for the pre-wrath rapture, then the arrow gets kind of wonky. But basically, seven, second coming appears at the far right of every chart. Well, guess what? The word second coming isn't even in the Bible. I hear a lot of people always arguing, well, rapture isn't in the Bible. They're, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. And actually, the word second coming isn't even in the Bible either. And yet, we know that there's going to be what we label a second coming... It just doesn't show up that way in English. We've got other words that describe the event that we would describe as second coming, a number of different terms, but the exact English phrase second coming doesn't even show up in the Bible itself, at least not in any translation that I've checked, and I'm just using the ones that are available to me online. I'm not, it's not like I'm going to go out and buy hundreds of different versions just, quick, just so I can see if they use the phrase second coming. So what's my point? The effort to disambiguate terminology oftentimes doesn't start with the Bible. It actually starts really with the words that we humans use. Then we go back to the Bible and see if the Bible is even using that term. If the Bible isn't using that term, then we just make ourselves aware. And then when we talk about and use the term, we let the people know, hey, there's a biblical term that's um, used to refer to the English term that we feel is a bit ambiguous. All right, those are the four views. Let's jump right in to the um, study. The study tonight is humorously named Post-Trib Pre-Wrath Rapture Smackdown Part 1. Part 1, you're like, what? Yeah, there's actually going to be two parts to this. The second part, I don't know if I'll get through all of this one tonight. I think I can get through it. It's not very long, really, in my opinion. But in Part 1... We're going to actually begin looking at the making the case for the pre, uh, pre wrath view, which really did. We're in topic number 11. If you remember from the um, topical index, didn't show up in the live class, it showed up in post production. Topic 11 is going to end with the post trip pre wrath raptor smackdown part two. So basically, in part one, I'm going to interact with a very well known post tribber who's describing, actually debating, a pre-tribber. And I simply pulled the notes of the post-tribber and created this uh, Word document that you're looking at right now, where I took the statements from the post-tribber, and then I, a pre rather who wasn't invited to the debate at the, at the time that it took place. It is available on YouTube, by the way. By the way. And I'll tell you in a moment who the debaters are. You'll, you'll know them. At least you should know one of them. I don't know if you'll know the other one. But... I took the notes from the post-tribber, which was his opening remarks, where he is describing why he doesn't believe in a pre-trib rapture. And the, my, the purpose of this study tonight, and that's why it's a little bit humorous, why I, why I call it SmackDown, is to show that at the end of the day, post-tribbers and pre-rathers have so much in common with one another, with one another that it's almost negligible, or the differences are almost negligible. It's almost like we truly are saying the same things, but we perhaps we don't even know it. We're probably not aware of it most of the time. And so I say this for a very good reason. When I listen to and read and watch resources on post-trib, often it is a reaction against the pre-trib that I'm listening to. It's kind of a rejection of pre-tribs more so than it is an embracing, an embracing of post-trib. It's like, I've read my Bible and I don't believe there's a preacher rapture. So, the only, so they think that the only viable option out there is post-trib and they just run headlong into the arms of the post-trib and then they feel good. But re in reality, the, the pre-wrath view that I hold to is actually so well-developed by now. It, it originated in the 90s with Marv Rosenthal, one of the fathers of the of the pre-wrath. And then shortly after that, the book um, that by Van Campen came out, like within five years later, like 93, 95, somewhere around there. And what has happened since then is it created a, a firestorm, a phenomenon that is sweeping through a lot of Christianity where people are realizing, wow, yes, pre-trib is um, very indefensible, but post-trib isn't the only viable option out there. Pre-wrath has some solid legs to stand on. And for good reason, it's because it seeks to synthesize all the strengths of the other three positions while discarding the weaknesses of those same three positions. And yet, 
many post tribbers currently current post tribbers of the day simply aren't aware that pre wrath is a viable option. And so instead of going from pre trib to pre wrath, they go from pre trib to post trib. But what I want to show you is that there's no really good reason why they should be rejecting pre wrath either, given so many of the similarities that I'm going to demonstrate tonight. So um, that's why I call, gave it a little bit of a humorous spin. Pre wrath rapture, post trip pre wrath rapture smackdown, right? Um, hint whoever wins, pre trip loses. Ha ha ha, right? You see my little LOL there. This reminded me of the um, when I, I stole this kind of uh, label, whoever wins, pre trip loses. From the uh, a while back, there was a alien versus predator movie that came out. Um, in the Alien franchise or the Predator franchise. I can't remember which one either. I guess it doesn't matter. It's both, right? But we know the popular scary monster, the aliens, and we know the popular scary uh, monster, the Predator. I say monster there, but they're both aliens, right? They're both extraterrestrial in that sense. And there was a poster campaign advertisement that showed Alien versus Predator, and then below it, it said, whoever wins dot 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 we lose and i thought that's interesting because in in the movie franchises both the alien character and the predator character hunt humans so it really doesn't matter who 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 battles between the two of them whichever one of them is the winner we the humans are still the losers so i thought mm, okay this is kind of the same concept post-trib pre-wrath whoever wins pre-trib loses okay again this is all a friendly in-house debate I really don't have anything personal against pre-tribbers or post-tribbers. I hope you guys all understand the the the, um, the uh, light-hearted nature of which I'm having these particular um, debates and things like that. All right, you guys ready? Let's work down through this. Now, I, at this point in time, I want to um, indicate that in the YouTube video that you're watching, there should be a link to the YouTube video that I pulled these um, just transcript of the debater from. And the debaters are, for the pre-trib, it's Pastor Walker, but I can't remember his first name. It might be David Walker. I apologize for not remembering off the top of my head. But his name, his last name is Walker. He's a, he's a, a well-known enough pre-tribber that he decided to do a public debate with. You ready for it? Dr. Michael Brown. Yeah, he's the post-tribber that I'm going to be interacting with tonight. I'm not really interacting with him. Obviously, I didn't get permission from Dr. Brown, but I don't think I need because I'm not debating him. I'm responding to him. So he is the post-tribber that we're going to be reading. Dr. Michael Brown is very well known for being the one of the world's foremost Messianic Jewish apologists. And some time ago... He decided to do a debate with Pastor Walker on why Dr. Brown doesn't hold to a pre-trib. Dr. Brown also did a video and a book with Professor Craig Keener, who's also a post-tribber. And Brown and Keener did a video, I believe, on um, something to the effect of why we don't believe in a pre-trib rapture. On the, I think the name of their book is... Um, not afraid of the Antichrist, not afraid to face, face the Antichrist, or something like that. I'll flash a, a screen grab in post production that shows the, the book and things like that. But that's who my post tribber is in these little notes. And so, what I decided to do is I took these uh, again, this is public, uh, public video. I mean, it's available for anyone on YouTube land. Just Google search it uh, Brown versus Walker post-trib versus pre-trib or something like that. And then you should be able to find it. So it's a very informative um, video. I recommend you watch it. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to read down through them. I've numbered them so it's easier for us to kind of keep track of where we're going. If we get through all of this tonight, great. If we don't get through all of it, I'm fine with that as well. You guys ready? Here we go. Point number one, there's no particular order in the numbering. This is just the way that Dr. Brown spoke. And when I transcribed it, um, I decided to break it down into like little um, statements or paragraphs that I could interact with. That's the only reason the numbers exist. Other than that, it's really just Dr. Brown talking during his opening um, statement.
statement about what he, why he doesn't believe in a preacher rapture. And the one of the main topics that's being asked, because debates usually have like one central question that they go after rather than this broad overview of why you don't believe what you believe. They usually tackle one main question. And one of the main questions, if I caught it correctly, in this particular debate is why Dr. Brown says that he doesn't believe that the um um uh, let me see let me find it here I, mean, I think it's one of the um okay it's point number three there's no support for a secret preacher rapture separate from the actual second coming and so um let me do this real quick uh I want to show you these slides. If you look at the pre-tribulation rapture, you'll notice that the rapture is on the far left of your screen, and the second coming is on the far right. You also have to remember that in the pre-trib model, they're working from the dispensational hermeneutic, which means they believe that the church and Israel are two separate dispensations. So they, they hold to your, your classic pre-tribber is also a classic dispensationalist, or at least holds to some form of dispensationalism that teaches that the church in Israel exists in two separate dispensations and God does not overlap them. And so the rapture of the church must take place outside of the seven-year tribulation, so-called tribulation, so-called seven-year tribulation, because the rapture of the church belongs to a different dispensation. And thus, the seventh week of Daniel that we that we uh, uh, recognize is the same time period as the seven-year tribulation. They're the same time period, just different labels, different groups. This time frame is given over to Israel. According to the dispensationalists, the seven-year tribulation doesn't belong to the church. Therefore, she can't exist inside of it. We can't have a rapture happening inside of the 70th week at all anywhere, which means the mid-tribbers in this next slide, begin to pull away from the dispensational theology of allowing the church to, to be located inside or um, exist inside of a time frame that's given over to Israel. Thus, in their name, mid-trib rapture, they are at least admitting that church, the church is in the middle of some time frame that should belong to Israel. But going back to the pre-trib rapture, they put the second coming at the far right because that's where the church comes back to earth after the seven years has finished. So their rapture and their second coming are both, as far as I can tell, outside of the seven year period. They, they exist in different dispensations. So this is part of what Dr. Brown is going to be answering uh, in the, he's, he's going to be re trying to refute. I don't believe in, um, a second coming followed by later by a third coming, right? Uh, first coming would have been 2,000 years ago. Second coming would be before the seven-year tribulation. Third coming would be the what we popularly call the second coming itself. Dr. Brown's kind of trying to combat that, and we can see that in some of his um, answers. There's not a stitch of scriptural support for a secret pre-trip rapture separate, separate from the actual second coming. So the debate is not over whether there is a rapture or not. Both Brown and Walker believe in the event known as the rapture, the snatching away known as the rapture. That wasn't the debate question, nor is the question exactly the timing of the rapture. Is it pre-trib? Is it post-trib? That wasn't the main focus. The main focus of the notes that I pulled was simply, is there a secret second coming followed by a third coming? In other words, are they separated by seven years? Uh, is it secret? Um, uh, things like that. So Dr. Brown's going to keep interacting with the, with the, uh, the, the fact that the raptures is not secret. It's quite noisy. It's not invisible. It's visible. And it's not separated by seven years, something like that. In other words, in case you didn't know, I mean, you should know by now, cause I've been teaching you for so long, but let me just show you the slide. Sorry, go backwards one in the post tribulation rapture. Where is the rapture? On the seven-year time frame, according to classic post-tribbers, which this chart is a classic post-trib chart, classic post-tribbers put the rapture at the end of the 70th week, at the end of the seven years. Where do they put the second coming? Immediately after it or at the same time. In other words, 
as far as they uh, as, far, as far as I've heard them articulate their position, the rapture and the second coming are one and the same event. So, going back to our SmackDown slide, it's not really a slide; it's a it's a um, it's a word document that I converted to HTML so I can read it on the internet. So I can read it in my browser. All right, let's read down through this. Like I said, I don't think it should take the entire class, but there's only, let's see, the, of the points, I think there's only like 25, something like that. But some of my answers are a bit lengthy. All right, here we go. Point number one, this is Dr. Michael Brown, his answer to Pastor Walker, who is the pre-tripper. Dr. Brown initially says, I don't believe in a second coming, followed seven years later by a third coming of Jesus. Hanavi says, need to do pre-rathers. Now, again, the point of my of this exercise from my perspective, right, I'm an observer to the uh, debate. I wasn't there at the debate. I'm just watching the YouTube video. But as I watched it, as I do with many pre-post-trip uh, uh, videos that I watch, I can't help but notice how un uncanny it is that the post-trib view and the pre-wrath view are so similar in many of their um, theologies and chronologies and sequencing and the way we interpret scripture. There are some differences here and there, and I'm going to highlight those, but for the most part, you're going to notice that I keep agreeing with Dr. Brown in that I do not hold to a pre-trib rapture either. And so um, in my push to... Uh, kind of promote the pre-wrath view, right? Remember, this topic is entitled Making a Case for the Pre-wrath View. I'm actually squarely aiming not really at pre-tribbers. I'm not trying to have a debate with the pre-tribbers out there. I'm actually trying to get the attention of you post-tribbers out there who are so convinced that your position is right, but perhaps you haven't heard how similar your position is to a pre-rather, and perhaps maybe I can convince you to take that one last step, as if it's really necessary, but to take that one last step to go from post-trib on over into pre wrath I mean, you already made the most uh, necessary step, which is to leave the pre-trib camp the position that I feel is largely indefensible from a scriptural perspective. Although, don't get me wrong, they've got their their positives, right? They've got their things that we pre-rathers pre also recognize. But in leaving pre-trib, I think the pre the post-tribbers just didn't go far enough. They only went to the one that was most popular at the time, which is post-trib, uh, instead of actually making the, 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 the leap all the way over. And we're going to find out a little later on that it's possible that Dr. Brown might actually be what we call actually hybrid which is like Joel Richardson, unless I'm misunderstanding uh, one of the things he's going to uh, be talking about. But let's go down through the list. So Brown starts out, I don't believe in a second coming, followed seven years later by a third coming of Jesus. Hanavi says, neither do pre rathers Dr. Brown says, I believe in one second coming, the Lord's glorious appearing, his literal arrival here on planet Earth at the end of the tribulation period. All right, now here's where Hanavi is going to start pulling away a little bit. Hanavi says, warning. Post-tribbers such as Dr. Brown often assert that the rapture and the second coming are the same single event that occurs at the end of what they call the seven-year tribulation period. In reality, the English phrase second coming, quote-unquote, second and coming, is not found in any English Bible translation that I have checked. This doesn't mean, let me interject with my own statement, my own answer. This doesn't mean that I don't believe in a second coming. I do. It's by logic. It's by deduction. It's by reasoning that we determine that there is a second coming because we recognize that there was a first coming. So I'm not saying that there isn't a second coming. We're talking about of Jesus, obviously. Um, but the phrase isn't found there. And the only reason I'm mentioning that, I'm not trying to get silly with my arguments like people who often do and say, there's no rapture in the Bible. The word rapture is not in the Bible. There's no Trinity in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. I really hate that argument because it's the dumbest place to start. It proves nothing that, that the English word that you choose to rattle off isn't found in your Bible, the Bible that was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. I mean, duh. So, but in this case, the word second coming isn't found in a Bible either. Um, so it's not found in any English Bible that I've checked. Thus, I go on to say, it 
often represents a somewhat ambiguous phrase in the mouths of Bible students from all four rapture camps. So I'll tell you why I think it's ambiguous in a moment. But I go on to say, the Bible speaks of a single parousia, which, when disambiguated by pre rathers includes a rapture and a second coming, but they are not conflated and combined in the way pre-tribbers interpret the parousia. Um, I have a typo there. It says pre-tribbers right there. I just realized that it should say post-tribbers. They're not conflated and combined in the way post-tribbers interpret the parousia. It's actually the... Let me go back over. The... Oops, went in the wrong direction. Let's go back up. The, I think I'll just go right to the, uh, the slide that has all four. That way I don't have to switch back and forth. The upper left corner pre-trip rapture has a pre-rapture on the far left and a second coming at the far right. They are not conflated. They are separated by seven full years. The mid-trib has two separate events separated by at least three and a half years. The post-trib does not separate the two events. They are the same event, as far as I can tell, or they're, they're so close to each other that one cannot tell when one stops and when the other one starts. Maybe they're just two events on the same day, something like that. The pre-wrath rapture, pre rapture, lower right corner, separates the two events, but they're not separated by seven years, and they're not separated by three and a half like the mid-trib. But it's not just a matter of timing. It's not that we're just moving the time um, shortening or lengthening it. It's not arbitrary in our choice of why we have two separate events. There's a reason why there are two separate events, and the length of the time frame is set by another um, set of passages in Scripture, but I'll, I'll deal with that a little later. But suffice to say that when we're talking about the second coming, or I'm sorry, when we're talking about the parousia, we're going to talk about this more, so don't worry if you're not catching it now. When we pre rathers refer to the parousia, which itself is a biblical term, there's one of them. And this single parousia can either be a description of the rapture, depending on the passage, or a description of the second coming, depending on the passage. But that's not to say that they're the same event. But we do say that there's one single parousia. So there's another slide that I wanted to show you. This one, give me a moment, let me exit out of that and show it to you. It's way down here. Um, all right. This particular slide that I created, this is my own slide that I created. I didn't um, just uh, scrape this from the internet like I do with many of my slides. This is one that I put together. This is a po uh, pre rathers understanding of the day of the Lord. And you have to understand by looking at this chart, we're not looking at the entire 70th week. So we're not looking at a rapture at the beginning of the seven years and a second coming at the end of seven years. In other words, don't confuse this slide, this chronology, <coughs> with a, a pre-tribber's version of the 70th week of Daniel. Rather, this is actually a zoom in on the beginning of the rapture and the, uh, i.e., the beginning of the day of the Lord and the second coming itself. In other words, this part of the slide, the, the sequencing, the, the chronology is well after the midpoint of the week where the rapture interrupts the great tribulation by Antichrist. So the point is that reading from top to bottom on the slide is that Yeshua's parousia is one single coming, yet two significant events. The word coming there is our English word that shows up in many Bibles. And yet the um, Greek word used often is parousia, but it's better translated as presence. It's not really focusing on the movement of the individual when we say parousia, such as Yeshua or some local, some uh, dignitary or king or politician or somebody that's um, traveling to a city. Rather, the word parousia properly is a, uh, it's made up of two Greek, Greek words, par and ousia. And the, the ousia part is presence. So it, we, we're really the focus is not necessarily on the movement so much as it's a focus on the presence of the individual themselves. So Yeshua's parousia is one single event. There are not two. Yet, this parousia, which we also recognize is the day of the Lord, the entire day of the Lord is the parousia. 
the parousia is one single event. It's not broken up into rapture and second coming. The parousia itself has these bookended events, one at the beginning, which initiates the parousia. That would be the rapture, red arrow pointing up. And the other event on the far right that kind of culminates or brings to a conclusion a significant part of the parousia, which would be the second coming. Reality, if you want to say that the entire millennium is the parousia of Christ, we could say that also, because it's the presence of Jesus here on earth that we're referring to when we say parousia, and Jesus definitely will be here during the millennium, if you believe in a literal millennium like we do, like most of us do, like most of the four proponents, four views do. So, the parousia is the day of the Lord. It's the coming of the Lord, but it's the day of the Lord. On the good sense, it's the coming of the Lord to rescue his saints and to gather them to be with him. On the bad end, for people who are wicked, it is the the bringing in of retribution and um, uh, punishment on the wicked, the destruction of the Antichrist at the second coming, etc., etc. So the day of the Lord, i.e. the wrath of God, commences sometime after the midpoint of the week, after the Great Tribulation, and after the sixth seal sign. That's how you know the sequencing of what you're looking at here. God's wrath includes both the trumpets and the bowls, but not the seals. Not entirely relevant right now, but, but it is part of the slide, so I thought I would read it. Very bottom, rapture versus second coming. Is there more than one return of Christ? If we were to ask Dr. Brown, he's going to say as a post-tribber, no, no, emphatically no, there's not more than one return of Christ. It's one of the first things he says in his opening statement. We pre rathers if you ask us, is there more than one return of Christ? What's my answer? The pre wrath rapture says no. There's not more than one return of Christ. The pre-wrath rapture harmonizes all relevant data into one working model. And what we mean by that is, yes, there's one return, but, and I'm going to flesh this out a little bit more in my answer, so don't get confused if you're not following along. It's necessary when we're looking at all of the references that are available for us that refer to this time frame of the coming of the Lord, that we realize that some passages are somewhat compacted or represent information limitation. They don't give all the details, which could either A, mean that the post-tribbers are flat out correct and that they are both the same event, even though we maybe we're only looking at the rapture, a passage might actually have the second coming in view, and maybe they are on top of one another, maybe they're the same event and we're only reading one. Or the other option is the way we pre-authors like to, like to interpret those passages as either one event or the other event, but we're looking at the bookends of the single event known as parousia. Rather, and that means that sometimes we're looking at the rapture event, which is the, the initiation of the day of the Lord, and other times passages are describing the second coming, which is the um, culminating event uh, part or the bookend of the day of the Lord. But either way, there's still the day of the Lord that we're talking about. So that's what I'm looking at. All right, let's go back. So I go on to say the pre wrath rapture model sees the rapture and the second coming. I think maybe I can actually start going like this, like I usually do. Give me a moment. There we go. The pre-wrath rapture. This way you know where I'm reading. The pre-wrath rapture model sees the rapture and the second coming both identified. Here we go. Both identified as the single parousia. It sees these this rapture and second coming separated by the much shorter than seven-year-long pre-trib version of the Day of the Lord, the DOTL, which itself is located between the two bookended events. Right? Recall that slide here. The day the DOTL, the Day of the Lord, is right in the middle of the rapture and the second coming. Not to be confused with when I go back to maybe the pre trib here, not to be confused with God's wrath, which is also in the middle of a pre trib rapture's rapture on the front end and the second coming at the back end. These they look similar. In fact, why don't I take something I've been meaning to do anyway? I may as well just do it now. Why don't I take that slide and put it right there? And so, what this allows me to do is you can take, sorry. I didn't want it there. I actually want it. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so if you look at this slide, rapture on the beginning, day of the Lord in the middle, second coming at the end. But then when you look at this slide, rapture at the beginning, 
Day of the Lord in the middle, second coming at the end. Sequentially, they look the same. And sequentially, I suppose they really are the same sequentially, in case, unless you don't know what you're looking at. This is the full seven years when we're looking at the pre-trib, but this is not the full seven years when we're looking at the um, uh, pre-wrath. So actually, I don't want that there. I'm going to move it down. Let's put it down there. That way I can get to it from here. All right. That's good enough. Okay, let's park it there, because that's where I'm going to get a lot of the discussion. Okay, let's go back over to my notes here. Okay, so you guys following along? All right, let's keep going. Dr. Brown says in point number three, again, remember, he didn't label the points. They weren't really point numbers. It's just my, uh, for ease of following along where I'm going in this particular commentary. In case you don't make it through, I can say we stopped at point number whatever. All right, point number three, there's not a stitch of scriptural support for a secret pre-trib rapture separate from the actual second coming. What does Hanavi say? Amen. Scripture doesn't teach a secret pre-trib rapture. On the contrary, the glorious, noisy rapture will be seen by everyone on earth simultaneously, as far as I can tell. Um, that, that is a bit of reading into the text when, it, when I say simultaneously. The text doesn't actually say simultaneously. But it does say every eye will see him. And if we're talking about the rapture instead of the second coming in those passages, then this is the support that we need to believe that the rapture will be seen by everyone as opposed to being a secret rapture. However, I go on to say, unlike post-tribbers, pre-rathers allow for the duration of the day of the Lord to separate rapture from second coming. So notice... Um, the reason I mention that is because Brown says there's not a stitch of scriptural support for a secret pre-trib rapture separate from the actual second coming. He believes they're not separate. We pre-rathers do believe they are separate, but we pre-rathers are not pre-tribbers. We do not believe they're disconnected. Remember, that to, in order to understand why this is important in our discussion, you have to keep reminding yourself, in the pre-trib model, the rapture and the second coming... At least the rapture, for sure. I don't know if they if they articulate the second coming this way, but the rapture and the second coming, as far as I can tell, are both outside of the dispensation known as the seven-year tribulation, which is for Israel. And so, whether the church is going up to heaven or coming back from heaven to planet Earth, either way, it's two separate dispensations when it comes to the church versus Israel. Again, this is classic dispensationalism perspective. So that's why Dr. Brown says the Bible doesn't talk about separate second comings. Well, guess what, Dr. Brown? We don't need to throw out the separate events in order to maintain our stance against dispensationalism. I already know that Dr. Brown is not a dispensationalist, and neither am I. Uh, many pre post tribbers are not dispensationalists. That's, in other words, part of the rejection of pre trib rapture includes a rejection of dispensationalism. So let's keep going. Point number four the teachings of Jesus and the apostles are against it, meaning this, these two separate events and a secret rapture. The, the, G, but not against the rapture, by the way, okay? He is, Dr. Brown is not saying that the Bible doesn't teach there's a rapture. Like, some post-tribbers take it too far. They throw, in their effort to distance themselves from pre-trib rapture, they end up throwing rapture itself out. They throw rapture itself under the bus, and they then they think, ha ha, I've won. I've, I've finally reclaimed the true biblical teaching on the end times. So I'm thinking, you went too far. Dr. Brown still believes in a rapture, as do I. And he's simply saying that the Bible doesn't teach a secret anytime separate from the second coming rapture. So he's very specific in what he's trying to say. The teaching of Jesus and the apostles are against it, this type of rapture. A mountain of scriptural evidence is against it. The Greek vocabulary is against it. Hanavi says we pre couldn't have said it better. All right, point number five. So... Let's look at the first Greek vocabulary of the second coming. Remember I mentioned earlier that the word second coming doesn't actually show up in an English Bible. What does show up then? Well, Dr. Brown says, let's look at the first, let's look first at the Greek vocabulary of the second coming. And I say, yeah, we pre rathers love to let the Greek support our view also. All right, that's why I keep mentioning parousia. Point number six, in Paul's words in Titus 2.13, quote, we are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing 
of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, not for a secret hidden event. Notice Dr. Brown quotes Titus 2.13, which uses the phrase appearing. Anavi says, yep, pre-rathers agree. We also, we pre-rathers are looking for a glorious appearing, which seems at face value, on the face of it, to refute a secret appearing. How could a secret appearing be glorious? The word glorious there implies just that, something that is noticeable. Even in the English, the word glorious is uh, has implications of that which is bright, shiny, noticeable, um, magnificent. You know, how could you describe something invisible as magnificent if there was no um, sensation at all that you could perceive if it was completely invisible? Okay, point number seven. Scriptures state that he will be revealed from heaven, which means that he will be seen. Which which is why we have verses that say that every eye will see him, right? In the book of Revelation chapter 1, every eye will see him. Um, the uh, Matthew 24 verse, uh, I think verse 30. Uh, let me just pull it here. I, I've got it referenced. I don't have to guess. 24, let me scroll down. Glorious return, starting in verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear, there's our word appear, in the sky, and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn. And look at this clause. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. In verse 31, in conclusion, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. So, of the four views that we're referring, that we're working from, pre-tribbers say that this, <coughs> excuse me, pre-tribbers say that this section of scripture right now is not referring to the rapture. Instead, this gathering is referring to unbelieving Israel at the end of the seven years. This is not the rapture, according to their model. <clears throat> because if it was, it puts the church in the middle of the seven years, and they can't have that, according to their dispensational perspective. So, the gathering in verse 31, which was seen in verse 30, right? Because it says twice. Once it says, appear in the sky. Then, it's all, then it says, the, the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. All of this visible, noisy gathering is not the rapture. Because according to pre-tribbers, the rapture is signless, noiseless. It's invisible. It's sudden. Only Christians see it. No one else sees it. Things like that. But according to the... Um, Post-tribbers and the pre-rathers, this is a rapture passage. The post-tribbers go on to say that this is also a second coming passage, but we pre-rathers make a break from them at that, at that point. What do the mid-tribbers say about this? Uh, I don't... I don't I, 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 their, their view, it's still just... Every time I research it, I, I just leave with more questions. No wonder, no wonder their view got abandoned. I think that they believe that the rapture is not secret, because it's right in the middle. I mean, how could it be secret if you can get to the time of it right being in the middle of the seven? I mean, no man knows the day of the hour doesn't really make sense to them if they're talking about rapture. But I'll, I'm not going to deal with that right now. That This is not a mid-trib show. We'll deal with that at a different day. I'll kick that can down the road a little, a little bit further. So back to our... Um, oops, I guess we're over here. Back to my presentation. The scriptures state that Jesus will be revealed from heaven, which means that he'll be seen and we will be gathered to meet him at his coming. His parousia, which in Greek speaks of a literal arrival of an actual presence, as in... Listen to Dr. Brown's humorous little um, analogy. As in, Flight 493 has now arrived, as opposed to, Flight 493 is flying by. His point is simply that the Greek word parousia means arrival, coming, presence. It's actual, as in, Jesus is here, and we don't need to say that, from a world's perspective, that plane flew by, and if you weren't watching, you missed it. It was a secret flyby. That's what it means by Flight 493 is flying by. But you can't see it. It's going to fly by, and, it's, and it'll fly by so fast that if you don't watch, it's, it's not going to, you're not going to, you're going to miss it. 
But no, he says no parousia is, is presence, and it's a presence that is noticeable by the recipients of the town. There's a there's a cultural meaning behind this word parousia that we'll talk about a little later on. Let's keep going in our into our slide. Hanabi's response, by the way, is this is still perfectly in line with a pre with a pre wrath. I, I just realized I um uh, left off in my sentence. I'm supposed to say this is still perfectly in line with a pre wrath rapture, but I left off the word rapture there. Oh well. Okay, point number eight. And this coming of the Lord takes place after a final time of tribulation. That's what Dr. Brown says. What does Ariel say? What does Hanavi say? Pre raptors say so far so good. However, listen up. We pre raptors identify this final time of tribulation using Brown's words, this final time of tribulation, quote unquote, as the great tribulation that cuts short the second three and a half year time period. We do not expect a rapture at the end of the seven year time period itself, like post trippers teach. So that's why when Dr. Brown says this coming, speaking of the rapture of the Lord, takes place after a final time of tribulation. In Brown's mind, he's referring to the end of the seven-year tribulation, right? Let's go back to the slider so you can see it for yourself. Post-tribulation perspective, all seven years in view. Where's the rapture? At the end of the seven-year tribulation. Where's the second coming? At the end of the seven-year tribulation. So, they're both at the end of the seven-year tribulation. But, by comparison... Pre-wrath says, where's the rapture? At the end of the tribulation. Great tribulation, but not seven-year tribulation. Notice the stark difference. Pre-wrath has a rapture at the end of the great tribulation, not the end of the seven-year tribulation. Or, at the end of a great tribulation that's less than seven years long. Because truly, post-tribbers say, yeah, it is at the end of the great tribulation. But, when does the great tribulation come to an end, according to post-tribbers? comes to the end at the end of the 70th week. In other words, it runs the entire three and a half years. But we pre rathers shorten it on for a good reason. We believe that the rapture interrupts the Great Tribulation, cuts it short, amputates it is what the Greek word implies. And the Day of the Lord then is initiated, and then the Second Coming, quote-unquote, is at the far end of that uh, Day of the Lord itself. So going back over, so Brown does some equivocating there where he says, after a final time of tribulation, but I don't know exactly if he means at the end of a three and a half year tribu great tribulation or at the end of a seven year tribulation period. I don't believe just yet that he he's referring to a tribulation that's cut short like we pre rather say. Although later on, he's going to say something surprising. So keep following very carefully. Let's keep reading. Dr. Brown, his answer to Pastor Walker. This is a, a kind of a humorous debate. Well, I say humorous. In my opinion, it was it was a bit comical. Dr. Brown is very cordial. So is Pastor Walker. Neither one of them were mean or malicious or mean-spirited or, or attacking one another with ad hominems or anything like that. It was a very clean debate as far as I can tell. It was moderated. It's available on YouTube so anyone can watch it. Just Google search or within YouTube, YouTube search Brown versus Walker, W A L K E R, Brown versus Walker, Rapture Debate, something like that. Or you can search pre trib versus pre rap, uh, I'm sorry, pre trib versus post trib Rapture Debate and just look at the thumbnails. I think it'll show the two gentlemen's faces. All right, so picking up our um, notes that we borrowed. We're only looking at Brown's response. I didn't. I don't feel necessary to um, refute pre-trib at this point in time. We've kind of done it in previous teachings, so uh, don't be disappointed if you're not getting that right now. This is uh, the purpose of this um, exercise right now. Humors from my perspective, this little smackdown is to demonstrate how similar we pre rathers are to. Post-tribbers. In the end, I think we might, if we could remove the equivocation, there's a lot of what we have to say that is just very, very similar. Um, there's some minor points in difference. All right. Brown says, as Jesus said, and here's another lengthy quote from Matthew chapter 24 this time, for as the lightning comes, this is what I just started reading anyway, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be, Matthew 24, 27, followed by, these are Brown's words, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not shed its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of heaven will be shaken, then the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn, 
And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. This is verses 29 to 31 of Matthew 24. What's Hanavi's response? Very short to the point. No Puriathar would dare argue with simply quoting scripture, right? Yeah. When your opponent quotes quote scripture without any assertion or um, presupposition or anything like that, you just have to say amen because it's scripture, right? It's God's word. You can't disagree with that. Okay, point number 10. And note that the same word, this is Brown, note that the same word parousia is used by Jesus just a few verses later when he says, quote, the days of Noah were, the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be, Matthew 24, 31. I think I should have put as the days of Noah were, something like that. I think I mistyped that when I transcribed this. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be, Matthew 24, 37. Notice it mentions the coming of the Son of Man. And Brown is highlighting and, uh, for us that this is the same Greek word parousia. What does Hanavi say? We pre authors also love that singular Greek word parousia, right? The one coming of the Lord. Let's keep going. Point number 11. Remarkably, Brown says, we just heard that these two, I'm sorry, we just heard that these are speaking of two completely separate events, the rapture and the second coming. Okay, let me pause because we didn't review Pastor Walker's opening statement, at least not in this video. If you've already watched Brown's video, then you know the debate, then you know that's exactly what he's referring to. And so in order for you to follow along with his refutation here, his, his response you have to remember, you have to know that when we go over to, back over to Matthew 24, the um, gathering mentioned in verse 31, and he will send forth his angel with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together as elect from the four winds from one in the sky to the other. According to classic pre-tribbers, this is the second coming. This is the gathering of national Israel at the end of the 70th week. However, starting in verse 32, um, yeah, and going down, we get to verse 36, and the, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not of the angels, nor the heaven, but the Son of Father alone, nor the Son of the Father alone. Verse 36, according to pre-tribbers, is a reference to, you ready for it? The rapture. You're like, what? And then from verse 36 through verse 30. Um, let me see, verse 41, if I remember correctly, pre-tribbers still believe Jesus is talking about the rapture. So what they think is that Jesus kind of went out of sequence, even though chronologically and sequentially rapture happens on the, on the, uh, on the, um, timeline first, and then second coming happens Second, even in the post-tribbers who believe that those two events are kind of conflated, overlapped, they still place rapture first and second coming second. Even though they're on the same day or they're the same event, they still place them in that order, rapture first, second coming second. All the other four models, all, likewise, if you remember from my uh, previous chart, may as well flash it in front of you now, I'll go backwards. <coughs> Sorry about the cough. Pre-tribbers, mid-tribbers, post-tribbers, pre-rapters, we all have the same order of these two events, if they indeed are two events, right? But these events, these descriptions, rapture, then second coming, all of us have the same um, sequence of those two events. But according to the pre-rapters, pre-tribbers, sorry, not pre-rapters, according to the pre-tribbers, in Matthew 24, up to verse 35, um, uh, Jesus is talking about the... Um, second coming. But then when he gets to verse 36, he suddenly, out of order, puts the rapture in view. And so, in verse 37, when it, where it says, for the coming of the Son of Man will just be like the days of Noah. Brown's point here is that the Greek word coming there, in, the ver in verse 37, is the Greek word parousia, which we could translate as presence if we want to. In fact, this NASB version that I'm using, this online tool, if you notice very carefully, Next to some words, it has these little um, superscript floating letters, smaller letters. Like in this version, it says AB. And if I click on it, it drops down to the bottom of the screen where there's a kind of a footnoting effect going on, where there's some uh, footnoted letters. And if I scroll all the way down to the AB, it says, just like so will be. Is that what I wanted? 
Give me a moment. Let me get out of that. For the coming, for just, just like the coming of the Son of Man will be. Well, that wasn't really, I guess, what I was looking for. It didn't capture the uh, word I was looking for. But just realize that in the Greek, the, uh, the word coming there. In fact, let's just double check real quick. Pull up the interlinear. Uh, verse 31. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Hosberger hai himerai tu noe hutas estai he parousia tu huiu tu anthropu. Anthropu. The, uh, just like it was in the day of Noah, so will it be, so will it be estai he parousia tu huiu tu anthropu. So will be the coming of the son of man. The word in question right there is right is Strong's number thirty nine fifty two parousia. So that's what Doctor Brown is highlighting is that Jesus uses the same word for coming in verse thirty seven, which uh, is used earlier of the rapture, but or of the second the, of the second coming. But now, according to uh, pre tribbers pre tribbers is use of the rapture, but to them it's two separate events. But Doctor Brown says. Remarkably, we just heard that these are speaking of two completely separate events, the rapture and the second coming. And, and here's where I have to start being very careful in my response. On the one hand, as you're going to notice my response, I share some agreement with the pre-tribbers that they are two separate events, we pre rathers do. But on the other hand, I share some agreement with the post-tribbers and that they're not separated by seven years. In other words, they're not the same event like pre by post-tribbers say. We pre rathers do not believe the rapture and the second coming are the same event, but we do believe they are connected to the event known as they are they are two bookends that are connected to the same event known as um, parousia. So that's where it gets a little confusing, and I'm doing my best to not be confusing. Um, I'm trying to be biblical in my representation. I'm using the, the, the words that the Bible uses, parousia. And yet, um, given all of the detail that we read about when we get to Revelation, and I'm going to mention this in my answer, it becomes necessary for we pre rathers to describe the bookends, to articulate them as the two separate events. Plus, there's so many details that uh, describe what is called the rapture and other details in other places that are describing what we believe is a second coming, even though that's not a biblical term. it What else can we call it? Um, I suppose we could call it the return? I don't know. I, I'll keep looking. Maybe there's a better term I sell itself. But let's read my answer. What does Hanavi say to Dr. Brown? pre rather say, boo, hiss, right? Laugh out loud. Hey, post-tribbers, don't get pre-wrath confused with pre-trib. While pre-wrathers do think that the dispensational version of pre-trib interpretations of the timing of these two events is woefully inadequate, by pre-wrath reckoning, the rapture and second coming are indeed two separate events, but they are inseparably connected to the single event known as the parousia, with a minimum duration of at least five months between them per Revelation 9.5. So again, it's that slide that um, I keep showing you. I suppose I can drop down to it now. Um, this will work for now. Uh, I didn't pull up my little fancy arrow. Uh, pointer that I was using last week, but it's this part uh, where it says God's wrath, day of the Lord, that is initiated by pre wrath rapture on the front and second coming on the back. Uh, that is the time frame that we call parousia, and that is one single event, but it entails it, it um, includes two significant marker events, one being the rapture and the other being the second coming. So let's keep going. Um, technically, I'm out of time as far as my um, timer goes for this particular uh, uh, study, but let me see how far, let me see if I can go to maybe, we'll read this one more here, and then we'll stop here at 12, because I think that's right about, let me scroll down real quick, 30, it's almost right in the middle, but it's, it's within the beginning of, a, it's within the ending of a um, kind of a thought from Dr. Brown, so it's a good place to stop. Point number 12, Dr. Brown says, Yet Jesus uses the exact same words and the exact same context to describe them. What he's talking about is Jesus uses the same words and context to describe rapture and 
second coming, he uses gathering words. He uses parousia, definitely. But notice what I'm going to say here for a moment, okay? So just follow along. Hanavi says, amen, like post-tribbers and to the dis... Sorry, give me a second. Like post-tribbers and to the dismay of pre-tribbers, we pre-rathers agree that Matthew 24 is a description of the rapture and not the second coming. But unlike post-tribbers, we pre-rathers do not conflate Jesus' words here as if they are teaching both rapture and second coming as one combined event. Pre-rathers tend to think that post-tribbers are reading into the text at this point, especially since the book of Revelation gives adequate enough evidence to believe in a single significant parousia event with two bookends that are separated by the day of the Lord itself. So this is a point that I'm going to double down on. When it comes to, and I'll close with this, I'm closing tonight, we'll stop here, we'll pick this up next week. When it comes to understanding Jesus' parousia and using what the Bible says, then we realize that when, and I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because I'm going to articulate part of this in another answer here, but when we, but I'll tell you now, I'll kind of tip my hand to you a little bit early. When we look at the, the information that Jesus gives us about this significant event, especially in the Olivet Discourses, it appears that just about everything Yeshua talks about, with the exclusion of maybe Matthew 25 at the very end of his discourse, but the majority of his wording seems to be centered around the event that we're going to describe as rapture. It is still part of parousia. It is part of his coming, but it is the initiating event, as far as I can tell. Even in the classic post-tribber model, it's still the one that comes first, even if they say that second coming is immediately second on the same day or at the same time, we still have the rapture in the, at, the, at the front part of it. So, in other words, Christians do go up before they come back down. Even if you say we're only going to do a brief U-turn and there's, we're going to spend no time in the air, just enough time to maybe meet the crowd that's riding on horses or Jesus himself or something like that, and then we all just float back down to earth. Either way, rapture is first, second coming is second. So, the point I'm trying to highlight, however, is that when we look at the words that Jesus gave us in all of it discourse, a lot of it seems to be centered on the event that we would later go on to call rapture, particularly when we start moving from Jesus into Paul's letters, like in the Thessalonians, we definitely have events that we can identify as rapture. However, um, a, a, an important point that we have to take into account is that when Jesus gave the, de the details to disciples, he seems to, and this sounds like speculation, and perhaps it is, but when we look at all the details and try to ascertain as to why there weren't more details that we would later know as Armageddon, second coming, things like that, we perhaps have to assume or speculate or assert that Jesus gave the information that they needed for their time frame, meaning he didn't want to concern them with a day of the Lord activities, a battle of Armageddon, and things like that. He didn't concern them with all those details. He gives them what, what they needed to um, go enter into the rough time that they were going to experience when the temple got destroyed in 70 AD and then later on. Likewise, when Paul wrote the Thessalonian letters, and I'm closing with this, his readers were already panicking that they were in the day of the Lord. They thought they'd missed the rapture. And so Paul needed to give them just enough information to identify the rapture, i.e., there's going to be this man of lawlessness. He's going to come on the scene. There's going to be this great deception, this, this apostasy that takes place first. And then the rapture slash day of the Lord is going to happen after that. And since you haven't seen the man of lawlessness yet or the uh, him setting himself up in the temple, declaring himself to be God, the abomination of desolation, things like that. Since you haven't seen those things yet, Paul would say, meaning since you haven't been raptured yet, then the day of the Lord isn't here. You're not in the middle of the day of the Lord. They thought they were in the day of the Lord because of the persecution they were going through. Perhaps they thought they were at least in the great tribulation. 
And many first century believers seemed to believe that they were going through the Great Tribulation. But Paul told them, and I believe Paul himself would probably have thought that they were going through the Great Tribulation because Paul included himself in first person when he talked about Jesus coming to return for us. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. He thought that maybe he would be among the living um, at that time. So perhaps he also thought he was going through the Great Tribulation. But what he didn't believe is that the day of the Lord had happened yet. The rapture hadn't happened yet. And so, um, the point, germane to my point, however, is that he still gives them enough information so that they can be prepared for the intense persecution that's happening all around them, i.e. much of the languages, rapture language, timing, uh, preparedness for uh, tribulation. Let's double down. You know, we, we're, we're in the middle of a hard time. Um Maybe the maybe the Antichrist hasn't been revealed yet. I don't believe he he believed that he was, uh, but we're definitely in a troublesome time period. That that any moment now the the the, the um, Antichrist could take a seat in the temple. Right? We didn't see that happen in the first century. Otherwise, someone would have written about it. But um, we had a precursor, a practice run, dry run, dry rehearsal, a dress rehearsal, whatever. Uh, you know, two hundred years before the first century with Antiochus Epiphanes. Yes, we had that. But by Paul's day in the 60s, right, 60s AD, there wasn't anyone who stood in the temple and declared himself to be God that we can uh, uh, that we can ascertain. So what we walk away with is we modern Christians now have the book of Revelation, which fills in copious amounts of details, not just of rapture, but primarily, in fact, the rapture is kind of downplayed, what is primarily emphasized in the book of Revelation is the day of the Lord activities, all of these fire and judgment and all that stuff, right? Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, that's what we get in the book of Revelation. So what does that do to our understanding of the all of the discourse details and the understanding of Paul? It puts everything in perspective and gives us, we pre-raptors, it gives us the ammunition that we need to describe two bookended events that are both wrapped around this singular event known as the day of the Lord or the parousia. And that's why we, that's one strong reason why we keep separating them as opposed to conflating them, smashing them back together. Like post, like a uh, pre rathers do. I'm um, sorry, not like pre rathers Why do I keep saying that? Like post tribbers do. So this is my way of saying post tribbers. Come on. You guys are so close. You, you've, 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 left pre-trib behind because it's indefensible and and that was the right thing to do and you took a step in the right direction towards um seeing that we christians are going to go through tribulation we're going to face the alpha with the antichrist but you didn't go far enough into pre-wrath but that's my humorous way all right we're going to stop here at point number 12 of 30 points not all of them are as long as this so uh, as you can see, some of them are pretty short. As I'm scrolling down kind of quickly, I'm not meant, I'm not meaning for you to actually read them. I'm just showing you how sh short some of them are. And some of them are long, some of them are short. But we'll stop here and pick this up next week. Um, with We'll start at point number 13. But that'll do it for Eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself, Ariel Ben Lyman, Hana V. I'm a tour teacher at Congregation K. Latinova, The Harvest in Thornton, Colorado. Find us online at graftedin.com and join us in person for our live Sabbath services. At least, as I mentioned, join us online. You can see the link to the video right there on my screen as well. These live internet studies are a part of my own Torah teaching ministry, which parks itself on the web at tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. I'd love to have you join me at my own home personal website there and browse around and take a look through all the commentaries that you see on my screen right now as well. I also have a YouTube channel that I'd be delighted if you popped in and Took a look around there as well. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Tetze Torah Ministries. If you do hit my website, my YouTube channel there, be sure to take notice that I update the site essentially daily, uploading videos daily. 
Make sure then to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave thumbs up for all the videos that you like, leave me some comments and questions about things that you have your own thoughts on, and be sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles, okay? Just some brief important details. If you'd like to join us for our live studies, be sure to get access to Skype somehow. If you're on my website right now during the live study and you click on that blue Skype link, it'll actually open up Skype on your browser and you can join us right there. We engage in live Q&A after the study is over, opening up the microphones and such, and it's exclusive to the live studies. But if you're not able to join us, take one last moment to scroll to the very bottom of my website where you can see some Hebrew writing in the black section down there and prayerfully consider partnering with me to take the Torah and the gospel around the world, you can click on the little yellow donate button and bless me that way with your financial gifts and contributions. And I'm so blessed to be able to be in a place where I can receive your generous gifts. Thank you to all of those who have given in the past and are continuing to give. I'm so thrilled to be on the receiving end of your generosity. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Let's turn to a Trinitarian response to Biblical Unitarianism. My name is Ariel ben Lyman Hanavi. This is a look at an apologetic work from the perspective of a Biblical Trinitarian such as myself. And we're interacting and at times refuting the answer to select scriptural passages from the Biblical Unitarian crowd. BiblicalUnitarian.com is a website about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. They are a Christian, they are a non-Trinitarian Christian denomination. They do not believe in a triune God. They believe in a Unitarian God. Um, what they have represented for us are scriptures that are often taken to be Trinitarian by your average Trinitarian, almost in an assuming way. Like, there, many Trinitarians are functional Trinitarians because that's what their pastor taught them. That's what they learned growing up. That's the Sunday school lessons they were taught, that, that God is three in one. That's the songs that they sing on, on, on Sunday services and during the Christmas seasons, right? God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You know, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the word, I'm, the song that's in my head right now. Well, Biblical Unitarian challenges that and says, that's just an, a narrative. You guys are stuck in an echo chamber, you Trinitarians. The only, an echo chamber, what I mean by that is when you're in a room where everybody in the room is saying the same thing, and so you're not really exposed to any extraneous perspective you grow up your whole life kind of hearing the same narrative regurgitated over and over again. And so it's it's kind of the same analogy as speaking to the choir when we say an echo chamber, if I'm understanding the analogy correctly. So Biblical Unitarian says, you guys need to wake up, right? We are the woke Christians. We woke up and realized that Trinitarian is a Johnny-come-lately um, theology that doesn't have scriptural support. And so they went on the offensive and reached into their Bible and took all of these passages that are traditionally assumed to be Trinitarian, and they said, let's take this back for the Unitarian God that we believe in. So what did they say? The following are clear explanations of the verses in the Bible that Trinitarians have sometimes used in attempts to prove the Trinity and to substantiate that Jesus is God, since there are an overwhelming number of very clear verses about Jesus Christ's identity and his distinctions from God, and since God's Word has no contradictions, these comparatively few verses must fit with many clear verses, and they do. So what do they believe? I'll rattle this off real quick. There's a little um, graphic that accompanies this in post-production that you're probably looking at right now. Biblical Unitarian says that God is one, He's numerically one. He's a Unitarian God. There's only one of them, and that's it. And the, the figure in the Bible, the biblical figure known as the Father, and the biblical figure known as God, they're one and the same. They are, um, the, uh, uh, they are numerically identical with one another. The Father is God, and God is the Father, and that's it. Who's Jesus? Jesus is a human. He's a human being chosen by God to be the sin bearer. So he's a unique human. He's virgin born. Yeah, nobody else has that status. He's a unique human. Likewise, he's the only one that God 
determined would sit at his right hand. So he is the son of God, but he's not divine, at least not in the capital D sense of the word. He's divine in a limited capacity um, or in special context, he's divine. Uh, but that's not a problem for biblical Unitarians. Either way, the, the major point is that he's human. He's not God. Um, even though he's called God in some cases, he's not capital G-O-D, but he's not really little G-O-D either. Rather, he's simply not the being known as God. He, you, we could say he's, he's God in, just simply in the same way that he's divine, right? He has a, there are special cases when we could call him God. And even um, some of the top biblical Unitarians or non-Trinitarians uh, think Anthony Buzzard, think Joseph, well, I don't know if Joseph Good's one of the top, but Buzzard, um, and say uh, uh, Dr. Dale Tuggy. They do affirm that Jesus is called God in the Bible, but that's not enough because the word God is equivocal. It has to be um, explained. But in their view, Jesus is human. That's good enough. Lastly, the Holy Spirit. Who is that or what is that? Notice I didn't say who is he. According to their understanding, the biblical, uh, biblical Unitarian, the Holy Spirit is an equivocal term. It, when, they, when the Bible is equating the Holy Spirit with God himself, in other words, it's, a, um, it's, it's just another way to, to describe God or to name God. Um, you know, predicate nominative or uh, a predicated a predication itself, something to that effect. Well, then they use capital H, capital S, Holy Spirit. That's God. That's what the Bible is just the Bible talking about this spirit who's holy, of which God is that spirit and God is holy. Other times, the Holy Spirit uses lowercase, lower, lower H, lower S in biblical Unitarian um, documentation uh, to indicate that it's referring to this. Um, non-personal uh, power anointing that God grants to human beings. So it's just the power that God extends to us, but it's non-personal. It's not, it's not a person living in us. Unless you say it's God living in us, then it is a person. That's true. God is a person. He's a being and he's a person, but there's only one of them. There's one being and one person. It's not one what and three who's like Dr. Bra Dr. White is fond of saying. There's one what and one who. That's the biblical Unitarian model. All right. That's the description. Let's jump straight into the passage. So they are looking at Jeremiah 23, 6, which out of the NIV is represented on their website as, this is the name by which he will be called the Lord of Righteousness. If we pull the um, verse up in its entirety out of the NASB, um, we have uh, Isaiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 23, 6 reading, quote, In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called the Lord of Righteousness. Who is that he? The one that they're referring to, well, the earlier verse do, um, identifies, let me do this, sorry. The earlier verse identifies as he as the righteous branch that the Lord will raise up for David. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. And then, verse 6, in his days, this righteous branch, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his, that righteous branch's name, by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Uh, when we looked at the Greek before, we realized that um, there's some simply transliteration going on. Um, Alton Kurias Yotzedek Hakalese. I'm sorry, Alton Kurias. Uh, the um, the calling of him, Lord Yotzedek. <laughs> In other words, down here, the last two words, Kurias Yotzedek, Yotzedek, not Sedek, but Sedek, is translated into English as, sorry, give me a second, let me get rid of that thing, there we go. In his days, both Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell securely, and this is his name by which the Lord shall call him, Josedek among the prophets. <laughs> that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, equivocation, just transliteration of the word. Yo is like Yeho, as in God's name, Y-E-H-O, Yeho, and then Sedek, S-E-D-E-C, is the transliteration of the Greek word, or the Hebrew word, Sedek, which is righteous. Um, it's because I didn't really read the Hebrew. I'm not really focusing on it at this moment. 
But if I were to bring uh, part of it up, um, you would see that um, the very last three words is um, Yikro Adonai Tzadiki, uh, I'm sorry, Yikro Adonai Tzidkinu. And so here's the tetragram with the name of God, which is represented in Greek as Kurios. And here is righteous oops sorry the righteousness of us tidkenu or we would smooth out the wooden greek or hebrew as our righteousness thus these two words would be the lord our righteousness like we have over here so uh but this root word righteousness is the hebrew word sadaka sadaka or like, as in like the, that singer from a long time ago, Neil Sadaka, right? Sadaka, Sadaka or Sadaka, Sadaka. Well, does that sound like, where is it? Sedek, as in, let me see if I can capture just the first part of it. Last part, there we go. Sedek is, is the uh, uh, transliteration really of the Hebrew word, Tzedek ka, tzedek, as in righteousness. So my point is that the Greek is not very helpful for us at this point in time. And the Hebrew wasn't even all that significant per se. So let's just stick to the English on this one. We left off last week, <clears throat> and I think we might be able to finish this tonight. Tonight, It's a very short essay that I wrote. It's an essay that's not available online anymore. It is available only to this. It's only available in this uh, YouTube video. And this... Uh, uh, essay is entitled Refutation of the Biblical Unitarian Argument on Jeremiah 23.6, Part 1, The Lord Our Righteousness by R. Oben Lyman Hanavi. So it's pretty straightforward, no fancy schmancy title, just let's talk about the verse. Here's where we left off last week. Point number four, biblical consistency in divine titles for Jesus. Let's go. Let me do my little highlighting thing. The New Testament repeatedly uses divine titles for Jesus, further affirming his identity as God. Jesus is referred to as Lord, Kurios, the Greek equivalent of YHVH, throughout the New Testament, for instance, in Philippians 2.11. In John 20.28, 20, Thomas declares to Jesus, my Lord and my God, which I, I didn't put the original Greek script this time, I just put transliteration, so you can follow along more easily. Kurios mu kai hotheos mu, which would, if I were to translate that literally from the Greek, ha is the, kurios is Lord, Mu of me, Kai and Ha the Thaos God Mu of me. So if we were to read Hakurias Mu Kai Ha Thaos Mu back into Greek, back into English with the syntax preserved, meaning the word order, it would read something like the Lord of me and the God of me. But that sounds too much like Yoda talking. So what we usually do in our English Bibles is we smooth it out by saying something like my Lord and my God, right? The Lord of me, my Lord, and the God of me, my God. But interestingly, Thomas spoke these words to Jesus and he didn't get rebuked for it. Now I know that the biblical Unitarians are going to come along and say, yeah, so what? Jesus is called God a few times. Jesus is called Lord all over the place. Yeah, he's called Theos a few times. They would say, in a limited sense, a Theos, a God, an Elohim in Hebrew, just means a mighty person, a mighty hero, right? Moses was called God before Pharaoh. Big deal. Jesus is called God. Yeah, of course, because he's a mighty hero. Doesn't mean he's divinity. Doesn't mean he's the being known as God. So they're going to downplay that reference to God in their answer. So I, I've heard their answers over and over again. So you Trinitarians who aren't aware of that, just be, just know that, just be forearmed. You're going to have to take your argument a little deeper than just saying, Aha! Jesus is called God! Problem solved! Mm, sorry, I wish it was that simple. But because of the equivocal nature of the word God in today's um, conversations, we've lost that argument as Trinitarians. However, that doesn't mean that originally that they didn't intend that. We, we, I'm of the impression that they were, the, the original writers more than likely did intend Jesus to be um, uh, 
identified as very God, i.e. deity, when they referenced God, him as God, called him God in those, what, relatively, I think half a dozen places, five or six places <clears throat> that show up in the Apostolic Scriptures, the New Testament. Yeah, I think they were actually giving him the deity attribute. I don't think they were downplaying it. In other words, I think their Christology was high, not low. But unfortunately, by today's skeptics, with, with, with our discussions going on today, um, we've kind of lost the force of that high Christology. Um, it's, it's an unconvincing argument to many skeptics, although it doesn't mean that we should abandon it altogether. I, I think it's good um, uh, ammunition. It's just, I'm prepared for the answer. So, the book of Revelation presents Jesus as sharing the divine titles Alpha and Omega, Revelation 1, 8, 22, 13, with God the Father, titles that signify eternal sovereignty. I bring them into my argument here because... Again, I believe the Bible uses titles and attributes and nomenclature for specific reasons, and I don't believe that it's simply to downplay the identity of Jesus like the um, biblical Unitarian model seems to assert. Um, I think that is, again, a reading into the text from their own Unitarian perspective, because I believe that if we let Scripture speak for itself as a whole, then we've got enough information to come away with this understanding that Jesus is not just God in a lesser sense, but rather he is God in the highest sense of the word God. Let's keep going. The um, attribution of divine titles to Jesus is consistent across the biblical witnesses. It's kind of, I'm kind of repeating what I just kind of gave to you in a moment ago. I believe that it is consistent across the biblical witness, further supporting the understanding that when Jeremiah 23, 6 refers to the Messiah as, quote, the Lord or righteousness, in quote, it is recognizing the Messiah's divine nature. Honestly speaking, I'm happy to know that biblical Unitarianism affirms and embraces Jesus as the one true Messiah, the Savior of Israel and of the world. However, much to their discredit, to relegate his representation of Yahweh and the way he can speak for God and as God to mere agency vis shaliach fails to account for the full biblical portrayal of Jesus' identity as both God and man. And I mentioned that briefly just to remind you that biblical Unitarian is Christian. Yeah, they have their shortcomings when it comes to their low Christology, in my opinion, as a biblical Trinitarian who holds to a high Christology. But at least they embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior, as the Messiah of the world, as Savior, as the exclusive Savior that God brought into the world. I can't say the same for rabbinic Judaism, right? And even though they're monotheistic like biblical Unitarian, nevertheless, they still haven't figured out who Jesus is. All right, let's pull the conclusion for this part one, because this is a two-parter. Conclusion. The biblical Unitarian argument that being called... Yahweh, or YHVH, does not imply... Let me try that again. The biblical Unitarian argument that being called Yahweh does not imply divine, does not imply divinity, overlooks the specific context and theological depth of Jeremiah 23.6. While altars or places can bear the name of God symbolically, the Messiah being called the Lord of Righteousness reflects his unique role as the embodiment of God's righteousness, not merely as a representative. Trinitarian theology affirms that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine, and the application of Yahweh to him is consistent with the broader scriptural witness of his divinity. And then here's, I'm going to pull in a quote from my favorite biblical Unitarian, Dr. Dale Tuggy. Yes, Dr. Tuggy, if you ever happen upon this video, which I don't think you will, but if you do, um, I actually, I'm a fan. <laughs> I listen to your uh, podcasts uh, every week. Uh, the the, um, the uh, discussions that you have on um, uh, discussions about uh, the nature of God and things like that from a... Because a, you, you, you have a high respect for the Trinitarian research, even though you disagree with it, but you respect the work nonetheless. And for that... I respect you. Yeah, even though I disagree with you, but I still hold you as a brother, as far as I can tell. In the words of prominent analytic theologian and biblical Unitarian Dr. Dale Tuggy, and I've rattled these off before, so I think it's worth repeating. 
He says, a more moderate and more defensible view is that Trinitarian theology is what best explains what is said and what is not said in Scripture. Got to give it to him. I, I, that's such a powerful statement and admission from someone of the um, of a reputation and a caliber as Dr. Dale Tuggy, who's a non-Trinitarian, by the way. His second point, this isn't the totality of his points being made, but it was very significant to me. Some of the most sophisticated biblical theologians and systematic theologians who are trained at Trinitarians take this view. If you're going to be a Trinitarian, I think this is the view that you have to take. And then lastly, he says, to say that creedal formulas are implied is a really strong claim. Maybe we should just say that Trinitarian theology best fits Scripture. But now what we have to do is compare it to its rivals. And this is practically never done. <clears throat> All right. So he's trying to get us, the, this, us Trinitarians to kind of up our game. And I appreciate that about him. Thank you, Dr. Tuggy. Thus, in my, con uh, in my conclusion here, to part one, I say, Thus, the name, the Lord of Righteousness, does indeed point to the Messiah's divine nature, aligning with the Orthodox understanding of Christ as God incarnate. All right, we've got about ten minutes left in the study. Let's, part, let's start jumping into the second part. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Here we go. Refutation of the Biblical Unitarian Argument on Jeremiah 23.6, Part 2. Jesus' Identity and Connection to the Righteousness of God in Light of Jeremiah 23.6 by R. Elvin Lyman Hanavi. What's the difference between Part 1 and Part 2? Part 1 is kind of the conceptual idea that Jeremiah 23.6 is, is consistent with the biblical portrayal of Jesus um, as being uh, the righteousness of God. Um, that is spoken of in, not just in Jeremiah, but is going to be spoken of in um, later parts of the Bible. It's the concept that when we're talking about the righteousness of God, we're talking about a person versus an inanimate object like an, like an altar or a mountain or something else that the Bible sometimes allows the label Yahweh to be applied to. Remember, part of Biblical Unitarian's objection to the Trinitarian view is uh, on this particular verse is that they say that just slapping the label Yahweh on something doesn't make it God, right? We can slap the label Yahweh onto an altar or a mountain or Jerusalem itself is called, you know, Yahweh, blah, blah, blah. And they say, well, that doesn't turn it into God. So why should we assume that that's true when it comes to Jesus, the man? We're going to slap the label God or Yahweh onto him and assume that that's, what, that, that, that that's because he is God? They're going to say, no, that's not the way the Bible works. I'm going to say that in part one, I dealt with the concept of, yeah, you're right. Slapping the label doesn't mean it's God. But now in part two... I'm going to take what I introduced as conceptual in part one and flesh it out. The, the New Testament actually does develop the idea that Jesus is not just another object that's represented by the label God or another object that is represented by the label Yahweh. Rather, he embodies the name Yahweh he is Yahweh in representative form, in human form, um, because of his uh, identity. Well, this gets a bit, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, part of it is simply because um, the, the Bible is trying to get us to uh, recognize, just like it did earlier uh, with like angel of the Lord and, and theophanies. A theophany is it's not just a representation of God. It is God in material fashion. It's the invisible God breaking into visible um, uh, visible nature, visible uh, um, physics, right? He's defying the law of physics by turning himself visible even though he is invisible by nature. He's breaking into his own creation. And he can do so because he's God. And so we wouldn't doubt, we wouldn't speak any less of a theophany. We wouldn't say that it's just a lower representation of God, we would have to, I would hope we would have to all agree that theophanies are really God. They're not less God than God himself. They really are God. They're just unique representations of God. But they are just that. They're representations of the very God. They're really God. 
You know, when God speak, spoke with people in the Old Testament, it wasn't entirely agency, wasn't entirely something different, separate, and yet it was very God. It, so it's difficult to articulate. Let's see if we can go in that direction. Here's the uh, passage represented again. In his days, Judah will be saved and, and Israel will live securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord of Righteousness, Jeremiah 26, 3. So in this next part, part two, there will, this will feel like a... Some of it will feel like it's repeated. There is a bit of overlap in the way I explain things, but it's by design because it's really one short essay. So let's go. In Jeremiah 23, we might not finish this tonight, but that's fine. We only have five or six minutes left, but we'll take a bite out of it, maybe one or two points. In Jeremiah 23, 6, the prophet declares that the coming Messiah will be called Yahweh our righteousness, Y-H-V-H-C-K-N-U, signifying... Uh, that Messiah will embody God's righteousness. This prophecy is key to understanding the identity of Jesus in the New Testament, where he is consistently portrayed as the one through whom God's righteousness is revealed and imparted to humanity. Remember, it's Jesus himself that pushed the envelope several times. You know, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, Before Abraham was, I am. Um, you know, allowing people to address him as God, Lord and God, and not re- and not rebuking them, uh, describing himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, things that God himself said. And so I know what Biblical Unitarian does is they're going to pull out their ace card, their agency card. Jesus is an agent of God, just like the Old Testament angel of the Lord was an agent of God. It wasn't really God. It was an agent of God speaking as God for God and as God. That's what they're going to say over and over and over and over again. I am going to go headlong into that agency issue one of these days. I'm just, it just takes a little while to prepare because it's so well crafted, but I'm going to touch on it, touch on it in this second part. So, this essay will demonstrate Jesus' connection to the righteousness of God by linking Jeremiah 20 through 6 with several New Testament passages, all of which affirm that Jesus is not merely a conduit of divine righteousness, but the very embodiment of it. In other words, we Trinitarians take the next leap that Jesus is not merely an agent of God, like the angel of the Lord is merely an agent of the Lord. We understand that, yes, it's paradoxical, but the angel of the Lord is God, and yet he's separate from God. But that's the way the Bible works. Point number one, Jesus as the source of righteousness in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.30 directly connects Jesus to the concept of righteousness. What does it say? Quote, But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This verse echoes Jeremiah 23, 6, where the Messiah is called Yahweh, our righteousness. Paul explicitly states that Christ became righteousness for us, meaning that Jesus is not merely pointing the way to God's righteousness, but is the very means by which righteousness is made available to humanity. This connection between Jeremiah and Paul highlights that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Messianic promise to bring God's righteousness into the world. He is the incarnate expression of Yahweh's righteousness, both in his life of perfect obedience and in his atoning death. I might remind you once again that the proof of the theology that I'm asserting here that Jesus is not just a representation, but he actually embodies that he is the righteousness is when we realize that God enjoys special, unique privileges and prerogatives that are unique to him, that are exclusive to him, such as being Israel's exclusive God and Savior and the way of salvation at the, um, in the um, eternal sense of the word. God alone controls those aspects. And thus, when God sent his son Jesus into the world, in the as the incarnation of very God, remember one God, but incarnated in the second person known as the Son, right? The Word made flesh, like John tells us. Well, then Jesus can then make statements of exclusivity that were similar to the Father because they are both very God. Thus, Jesus can, can say that no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, if Jesus was just a representative, then at best, all Jesus could do would be point the way to the Father. But 
in the theology at the end of the day, you could actually go around the representative and get to the father because the father and the representative are two different things. Herein lies the paradox, the part that biblical Unitarians don't like to equivocate on. They don't like equivocation. They don't like it. Analytic theologians don't like this. God and God, God is one being by which Jesus is the incarnation of in, in human form. Thus, God, uh, the, the, um, the Father and the Son are different in person, but they're the same in essence. And we have to push this far enough to the point that we're going to run into what could be considered a logical fallacy because uh, things that differ aren't the same thing in some, in some absolute sense of the meaning, right? I don't want to go down a philosophical rabbit hole of trying to explain a numerical identity and things like that, absolute identity <clears throat> or um, um, uh, any other kind of identity theories. I'm not trying to make it that type of discussion. But in its simplistic form, when Jesus uses exclusives like um, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me, I take those words to, to mean that we cannot bypass Yeshua in order to approach the Father. Jesus is the exclusive representat representative, but he's also hinting at the fact that he is the exclusive stop point. The buck stops with him. You can't go around him. Likewise, he says that no one, uh, no one can approach the Father unless the Father draws him. So both these verses being in John, I'll flash this on the screen and post. Both these verses hinting at this exclusivity, exclusive arrangement that the Father and Son have with each other uh, uh, to allow humans to approach the one single God. And that's how I believe these two verses that you're seeing in post-production in John work together. We can't approach the Father except through the Son. We can't approach the Son except the Father draws us. And this is because of the, the nature of the single being known as God, even though we've got two persons, Father and Son. And so, what I'm going to attempt to do as we work our way through these, uh, this second part is to show how that the better biblical model is recognizing the exclusivity of God's identity is seen, likewise, in the exclusive identity of Jesus as not merely a man, but as the incarnated God. And so, to approach God, we approach the man Jesus, and in so doing, we realize, even though it stretches our understanding, that we're approaching very God and not just a, represent, a representative of God. In the end, if Jesus is merely a representative, then the Bible should indicate in some way that there are limits to the God identity that Jesus enjoys. It should cut that limit at some point in time. We're not talking about limiting him in his human representation. That's that's to be a, that's a given, right? Humans are limited. Period, right? I I get it that Jesus had limitations uh, as a human. He's human just like I was, right? We all we humans have limitations, but there are places where the Bible describes prerogatives that Jesus enjoys. Um, activities that he participates in that otherwise the Bible in plain language is, is articulating in a way that we should ascribe to God alone. And so we'll get into that in time, but that's going to do it right now. Uh, we'll stop here uh, at point number one. We'll pick this up at point number two, imputation of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5.21. But that'll do it for the Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. Let's close in prayer. I bless your name and thank you for the studies. Um, I know so very little when I when I look back at the topics that I'm that I'm uh, teaching. Uh, it may look like I know a lot, but in the scope of things, I just know so very little. And so I'm just going to keep availing myself of your words and of your spirit, so that I might inform myself much better. Um, I know I'm going to have to wait till I meet you to fully. Uh, understand and explain your words, but until then, uh, I believe I'm mandated, uh, I'm commissioned, I'm implored, I'm um, um, invited to keep pressing in and to keep studying so that I can know you more. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your protection and your provision. Uh, continue to raise us up and to be with us, Lord. Uh, go with us this week and bring us back together next week, should it be your will. We'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. Bashem Yeshua. Amen. Oh,